Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to uh, tonight's uh, webinar. Welcome to the ninth uh, Tugs Asia Symposium. So uh, today we will be uh, discussing more in detail about uh, uh, advanced MIS and uh, going back to uh, basics. Uh, TUGS is actually an international society that represents the global uh, community of upper gastrointestinal surgery. Uh, it's various subspecialties, including esophageal cancer, benign upper gastrointestinal cancer, hepatobiliary surgery, bariatric, and metabolic surgery. And uh, TUGS aims to provide an international platform for continuous education and uh, collaboration uh, on academic matters and research to improve management of uh, gastrointestinal diseases. Uh, actually, at present, uh, TUGS already has around 2,000, more than 2,000 uh, members. Uh, to start, uh, let me call on uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin uh, to to have some words from uh, Dr. Kevin Boone. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Nine Tax Asia Symposium. Um, thanks, uh, Romy and the team for organizing this tonight. So um, today we are going to talk on uh, another team, which is uh, at once uh, MIS and uh, back to the basics. So basically, um, we are very honored to have a very strong team of faculty to share with us some tips and tips and tricks, how, um, what, what to do and what not to do and how do we at once um, to master the skills of at once laparoscopy as well as endoscopy. So um, we are honored today to have um, three um, panelists with us. So um, first, of course, uh, that, uh, we have our good friend, um, Dr. Wormi from um, Joseph St. Lingard Hospital. He is a consultant and MI surgeon. We also have a Jimmy So um, from Taiwan, um, as well as a Ray Samiento from Philippines. Okay, so um, as, as usual, as you notice, um, all of you are muted upon entering to this um, meeting. So um, feel free to um, put on your comments or questions into the chat box function on your screen. We shall reserve all um, questions after all three presentations in the Q&A sessions. And um, this meeting will be recorded for future replay. So um, your participation actually serves as a consent for us to record you down for future replay. So all our previous sessions are actually available on Tuck's YouTube channel. So if you're interested in the previous sessions and even if any of your friends that missed today's session, feel free to look up for our replay in Tuck's YouTube channel. Um, without further delay, probably um, I'll pass back the stage to Wormi um, to, to introduce the panelists as well as to kickstart the meeting tonight. Wormi, back to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Kelvin. Uh, tonight, I'll be uh, joined with uh, two other panelists, uh, Dr. Jimmy Su. Yeah. Jimmy is a consultant, yeah. uh, MIS uh, surgeon at the uh, Shou Chuan uh, Memorial Hospital, and is also a faculty uh, of uh, AirCAD Taiwan. Hi, Jimmy. Hi. It's happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. And we'll also uh, be joined uh, tonight by uh, Dr. Arlene uh, Canonias uh, from uh, Rizal Medical. He is, uh, she is actually a consultant and MIS surgeon for uh, hepatobiliary and uh, surgical endoscopy. She is uh, currently as well the training officer for the uh, surgical endoscopy uh, UMIS uh, training program. Dr. Canones? Oh, there. Okay. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello. Yeah. Sorry for that um, technical problem. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Uh, nice, nice to see you. So uh, now we'll, we will proceed to, the, to our uh, first uh, lecture. Uh, Jimmy? Yes. Thank you. My name is Jimmy, and it's our my honor and privilege to introduce, I think it's a tax surgeon in, in Asia, the Professor Fimur Kumar Basodian. Professor Fimur is the vice president of AOSA. He also is the 
the president of the Society Endoscopy Laparoscopy Surgery of Malaysia. So not only his title, but also his, his education or his uh, passion and training. So we we looking, really look forward to his lecture tonight. So Professor Fina, you have the screen. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay. So thank you to the uh, TAGS team, uh, Vermi, Gracia, and uh, Kelvin, Jimmy, and uh, uh, Arlene for the invitation. Uh, indeed, it's an honor for me to, to give a talk on this uh, platform. Uh, I've been watching uh, TAGS uh, grow from uh, the initial invite uh, in think, uh, some time ago, uh, and uh, that's uh, suddenly taken over the whole world of uh, GI, upper GI surgery, like a bit like the COVID, huh? but in a good way. So my, my topic uh, is basically going back to the, uh, the, the, the initial uh, products which uh, make us a good MIS surgeon. So how do we choose the right instruments and how to prevent or take precautions against possible injuries? So this is how surgery was done. Uh, Maybe uh, when, when I started, Ellen started uh, doing surgery. So uh, we were doing a lot of this surgery. So your, your senior uh, consultant comes in and uh, if he sees a small incision, you are in for trouble. The bigger the surgeon, the bigger the incision. This was the requirement. Instruments were few. At least what we had were few. And we had to do all kinds of surgery uh, as needed uh, with these instruments. However, uh, uh, historically, uh, you see, uh, this is how the, the advent of laparoscopy came about. But it is not; it is only after the uh, introduction of newer imaging, better instrumentation, and uh, uh, all those things which you, we all take for granted nowadays that uh, laparoscopy actually blew up, uh, you know, and uh, was embraced by all uh, disciplines of uh, surgery. Okay, so these are all the advantages. I'm sure everyone on this uh, panel or participants will know. Uh, you know, smaller wound, uh, less risk of wound infection, less bleeding, less wound breakdown, less risk of hernia, nerve entrapment. You see. So less pain results in earlier mobility. Most earlier mobility results in earlier discharge, less length of stay, the reduced tissue trauma. So a lot of uh, benefits of laparoscopic surgery, yeah. It looks like the ideal godsend procedure for to ail uh, to 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 correct all surgical ailments in the world. However, there are limitations, at least in the initial years. Uh, it uh, these limitations have uh, become better and better uh, as time has gone on. Uh, okay, so in terms of equipment, okay, the camera system was the revolution. It changed uh, the the way a surgery was looked at. Uh, from the time in the 90s and the early 2000s where people thought that this kind of surgery was absurd, you know, uh, and uh, to now embracing it and even becoming gold standard in many types of surgery. Insufflators, uh, technology has improved, light sources. Uh, so you need all these things, okay? Uh, these are the basic devices you need to perform any kind so if you have no access to uh, this kind of uh, devices, then obviously you will have limitation. Limitation uh, to even begin doing laparoscopic work. Forget about doing more uh, complex surgeries, okay? So, so basically, uh, you may need a mixture of all of them or some of them to be able to do uh, some form of laparoscopic surgery. But as the higher you go up the pyramid uh, and the more complex the surgery gets, the more advanced uh, that you need uh, instruments may be required. Now, in terms of the surgeon, uh, the moment you do a laparoscopic or MIS surgery, your, your skill set has to change. You see, you have to relearn hand-eye coordination. There is no more uh, 3D perception. You, have, you are working with 2D. Okay, so depth perception and uh, intra, uh, you know, inside the, the cavity, uh, doing uh, procedures may be a bit more difficult. 
uh, and takes time to master as compared to open surgery. That's why in our earlier era, a lot of senior surgeons found difficulty adapting to laparoscopy and uh, subsequently they thought it will be difficult for everyone. But uh, time has shown that uh, the, 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 the younger guys adapted well and learned it faster. In fact, so that's why uh, that's how we started and this is how we are now. Okay, so even the loss of tactile uh, sensation uh, has been uh, accounted for and we have improved on it and instruments have got better and we realized that we, 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 we learn to adapt to pressure. So not necessarily putting your finger inside, we get the indirect tactile sensation. Cost was always an issue. That's why many uh, countries, especially in Asia and Africa, were left behind in the in the way for uh, MIS. But uh, nowadays, with so many companies involved in manufacturing devices, uh, so many surgeons skilled in training, local surgeons, such as in Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, we, we have... I remember when we were uh, starting out, Ellen and me, we uh, surgeons who taught us they had to come to our country from Western countries, and it was not so easy. And it was also costly for us to go to them. So now every country in Asia, they have uh, tons of skills and uh, senior surgeons uh, like Ellen and all that. Okay. Uh, so uh, Kelvin uh, and uh, Bumi. Okay. So uh, cost uh, slowly has come down in that way. Okay. Many studies show that uh, if you look at the overall cost of a laparoscopic surgery compared to open, uh, the cost may be uh, similar. Okay, if you look at the, the 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 benefit of a laparoscopy and count it as cost. Okay, now limitations in terms of bleeding. Most of the time, when you have bleeding, you will convert. So, as you get better, the risk of bleeding reduces. As you get better instrumentation, the risk of bleeding reduces. And definitely, there's a learning curve. Uh, involved. Extraction of large specimen also presents uh, limitation, okay? Sometimes you have big uh, uh, tumor, so you can do it laparoscopic, but taking out needs a big incision. So this becomes a uh, problem. Now, uh, it's not possible for me to look at every surgery and look at uh, how to improve, okay? So I will just look at the gold standard one, uh, lab coli. So these are the risk factors of conversion for laparoscopic. So why we convert, okay? Uh, when extreme of age, uh, patients come in emergency uh, setting, uh, inflamed tissue, a lot of adhesion, chronic inflammation and uh, in, in, infiltrate. These are the significant factors which cause us to convert uh, lab coli, uh, sorry, open coli to laparoscopic cholecystectomy, okay? So uh, with this in mind, uh, and these are the complication uh, uh, are seen with laparoscopic surgery, okay? We get vascular injury, which are varying uh, gradient, okay? Uh, visceral injuries, uh, solid organ injuries, sometimes uh, complication related to the use of the gas, okay? So with this in mind, I will go on to the instruments in laparoscopy and tell you what are the instruments being used, what are the, what are the uh, strides we have made in terms of development of instruments and uh, possibly uh, how to choose when to use the instrument. So the most important is the imaging system. Okay. Now, when I first started uh, in 1990, I think, uh, sorry, in the year 2000, I started. Uh, so I was operating uh, on laparoscopic gallbladders with the halogen light system. So everything was looking jaundiced, you know. So it was not so easy. So that is the only thing. You can only probably do just gallbladder, maybe some appendix and do some additional license. So when the standard definition uh, camera system came, we thought, wow, it's so clean, you know. Uh, so, but uh, this has gone a uh, generational change. Now we got the high definition, which is already old. We have got ultra high definition. We got 4K system. And then to reduce the re uh, problem uh, associated with uh, uh, depth perception, you have 3D systems, which uh, almost mimics the, the 3D system of the robotic uh, system. Okay. So uh, in terms of uh, imaging, you also got the indocyanine green, okay, uh, where you, 
you can uh, uh, inject dye uh, just at the time of the uh, procedure or when you want to highlight certain things like in colorectal to look at the vascular marking so that you know where to staple okay uh, without risking a leak so you see by using this icg you can reduce uh, risk of uh, anastomotic leak which is a major thing in colorectal or gi surgery upper gi surgery even if you are doing a hepatobiliary surgery use of indo indocyanin green uh can uh, allow you to visualize most of the time the bile duct so if difficult cases uh you can look at the bile duct uh and uh, and uh, and uh, use that uh, icg uh, highlighting on the bile duct to make sure you don't injure it this possibly in the future uh will become uh, a better tool to identify the bile duct as compared to even your on table phalangogram okay uh then we get the integrated or system uh, many people will have this uh, uh this is a system where the or system your laparoscopic system is connected to uh, a computer uh, on a server it, it you you can use this to store your videos you can use this to teach and train your trainees you can sit in your clinic and watch your trainees doing surgery and you can guide them through you see so the the consultant need not be in the operation theater uh, holding hand and uh, you know uh, reducing his uh, his uh, precious time spending with the patient care so he can sit in his clinic see his patient and at the same time keep an eye on his trainees you see so these are all the things uh, which have improved uh, in uh, in uh, in the in the era of laparoscopy and and they themselves have uh, resulted in uh, better care less risk of conversion to open surgery okay uh, and uh, 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 better visualization always results in better surgery okay so the other thing uh, personally i like to do is to do surface marking of uh, the my surgery so that uh, easier to uh, visualize for trainee okay so i'll do markings and uh, i will also give preemptive analgesia onto my trocar site so by doing this my trainees will learn i also will get better uh, and uh, and uh, the nurses scrub nurses and the theater staff all will know uh, what are the instruments required and where to put the pod and the things okay now pneumoperitoneum is a uh, may uh, uh, sometimes is the first step when you want to do laparoscopic surgery isn't it uh, creating pneumoperitoneum you have to create space now there are a few methods uh, the open one is a time tested uh, a lot of people like to do it with or without the open trocha you open up uh, either below the umbilicus through the umbilicus or above the umbilicus okay you make a space and then you put in the trocha uh, and uh, introduce carbon dioxide now uh, some people especially the gynae community they like to do a close technique using a various needle which is shown here it is spring loaded you have various types you have a metal uh, you have a re uh, reusable type you have uh, the disposable type okay personally i use the disposable type uh, if you are using the reusable one always as a surgeon make sure that the spring loading works well you have to check it because sometimes uh, it has not been assembled well or the spring loading it doesn't work the needle is not sharp enough so you have to uh, always check the system otherwise it becomes a liability okay so uh, we will introduce a very needle so the optical trocha usually we use for very obese people you cannot uh, hope to uh, do a open technique of pneumoperitoneum in a very obese patient if you are saying say you are doing bariatric surgery by the time you go into the abdominal uh, cavity you probably waste a lot of time you need a big incision you may have caused bleeding okay so you need to learn how to uh, use varies uh, safely as well as optical trocha you see the figure uh, here shows yeah, you load the, the the scope a zero degree scope into the trocha and then the various stages of uh, penetration uh, rectus sheath rectus muscle posterior rectus sheath peritoneum and line abdomen so this is one of the safe ways of introducing a trocha and then insufflating with carbon dioxide okay so i just show you uh, the process of inserting a uh, very needle 
uh, which I use uh, for my day-to-day -day, uh, work. So I always give local anesthesia over the uh, incision so as to anesthetize. This uh, study has shown that when you do this, it reduces post-operative pain. Then I use two little wood, grasp the edges, lift it up, the very needle. So then I do a little bit of dissection to look at the rectus. Okay, then the very needle is held in a pen holding. So two clicks and then you are in. Then always test it, every case, water and then droplet. If your droplet is running in, then you know you are in. Then connect it to the carbon dioxide and then you can see the insufflation. Okay. And then it starts slow and then slowly builds up. Okay. Once it's filled up, a pressure of about 12 to 15, then you can introduce your first stroke out. So, yeah. If you have any difficulty or a patient has that previous surgery, okay, uh, then you can use an alternate side at the left hypochondrium, which is also known as the farmer's ankle. So, you must know these options. If you see any previous surgery and previously laparoscopy has been done, if you're not sure, uh, should I go back and put the very needle there, you know? Uh, doesn't mean that if you do open in that situation that you won't cause injury. The bowel can still be there. So normally what I will do is I will go to the left hypochondrium, just a small step wound, put a very in place, and then I put a 5mm uh, uh, troca, I put a 5mm telescope, have a look, see in the abdomen. Where can I safely put my troca? Do I need to do additional IC? You see? So this by doing this, you can prevent unnecessary entry injury. Now, telescope, when you're starting out, most people will have only zero degrees. Uh, as you advance in surgery, you must learn the skill of uh, holding and uh, using a 30 or 45 degree scope. If not a 45, at least a 30. Okay, so uh, why? Because only then you can have a wider spectrum of view and you can do more advanced surgery uh, and, get become, uh, and become more skilled. Okay, and there are rigid uh, telescopes, uh, flexible telescopes. So, uh, rigid telescopes are the universally used one. There are flexible telescopes from Olympus, uh, where, the, where the, the end is uh, flexed, and you can look from different angles. But uh, it takes a very uh, expert cameraman to hold that. I work with that, and I find uh, it's a bit difficult. If the cameraman doesn't know how to handle it, uh, the surgeon will suffer. So, I... I I perform most of my cases with rigid scope, but it is an option. Now, hand instruments are vital for laparoscopic surgery. You all know what the hand instruments in laparoscopy looks like. It's similar to open surgery instrument in terms of names, uh, but uh, their design is uh, long, slender, okay, and uh, uh, used specifically for laparoscopic surgery, and uh, you cannot interchange them. So the basic dissectors you have, the commonly used one is Maryland or sometimes right angle for that. The graspers, which can be traumatic, atraumatic, tweezers. Uh, uh, so uh, instruments are very important. Bowel graspers, curved ones, straight ones, uh, single action, uh, double action, okay? And needle holder, okay? So you need all these hand instruments to do the variety of cases, be it a gallbladder, be it a hernia, uh, upper GI work, uh, benign malignancy, you need to have these instruments, okay? So, without these proper instruments, you cannot do. And then you have to account for the fact that the patient is very high BMI, say, obesity patient, uh, a bariatric surgery patient, or surgeon who are extremely obese going for general surgical work, you need to have long instruments. You cannot work, uh, You one size doesn't fit all. So, you must have uh, long instrument. If you are going to do a very obese person, you need to think about this. Uh, if not, during surgery, you realize that you are struggling, you don't have the instrument, then you are, you are adjusting your port size and then you are uh, risking more complications. So, the, uh, you must have uh, at least basic instruments uh, and uh, all sizes. If not, better not to do or try to get the company to lend you some of the longer instruments. So, this is very important. Hand instruments, don't take them for granted. Know what you have. Take care of them well so that they will last you long. 
then we came into the era of procast when i started we have a metal reusable screwed and screwed one okay sharp tip uh, blunt tip uh, safety trocast we had then we started getting bladed trocast okay now the at the uh, edge at the end of the trocast there will be blade then we went into the era of uh, non bladed trocast uh, which uh, which uh, causes uh, entry through a, a point so uh, that uh, the risk of herniation is reduced okay and then we have a hasan troka we have optical troka which i already explained earlier then we came into silk troka with single incision uh, laparoscopic uh, troka okay which is uh, bigger and wider and multi instruments can go through so trokas are important so at the current moment my recommendation will be to use the non bladed one because bladed one sometimes can cause injury to bowel and uh, vascular structures uh, okay so non bladed are better uh, learn to use them uh, and uh, you must have various sizes especially if you are doing a uh, bariatric patient you must be ready with the longer one okay if you are operating on the chest you may need the shorter one so energy devices now this has been the single biggest influence on the uh, ability to do advanced laparoscopic work okay i remember many years ago there was a surgeon in malaysia uh, doing gastrectomy and colorectal work uh, using diatomy only at that in that era there was no uh, all these ultrasonic and bipolar advanced bipolar and all that so he had high mortality and until he was asked to stop doing so this actually set laparoscopic surgery back in malaysia by many years because all the senior surgeons became very wary of uh, anybody doing laparoscopic work until uh, uh, you and i were able to change uh, the perception okay so energy devices their their revolution has really revolutionized uh, the practice of laparoscopic surgery uh, so now when we going for major surgery we have almost all of these we we always use, have need for monopolar or bipolar Uh, advanced bipolar which allows you to seal vessels uh, up to 5 to 7 mm okay you got ultrasonic dissectors you got thunder bead so many things okay the uh, and uh, it how do we choose uh, basically uh, uh, i think any one of them can be used uh, interchangeably for most of the surgeries you need it's only the uh, very advanced surgery in certain uh, uh situation where we may need uh, both okay so with a monopolar diatomy and a advanced bipolar or monopolar with the ultrasonic or monopolar with the thunder bead you can do uh, almost the whole spectrum of uh, surgery except if you go to liver uh, you may need the kusa okay so when you when you use this uh, energy devices uh, individually without clips on the name the vessel like say colorectal the ima Uh, please apply it at the right angle because if uh, if you are not applying it onto the vessel at the right angle the di- the diameter of the vessel actually become uh, larger then it may not seal if you worry clip and use the the vessel sealing okay now the other things we use for hemostasis or anastomosis uh, is uh, initially it was all suture and clip then hemlock came in i'm sure you know what a hemlock is uh this is the one so nowadays for clipping of the cystic duct or vessels during a uh, say d2 gastrectomy or any form of gastrectomy uh upper gi low gi we use hemolog okay sometimes uh if the uh, surgeon is uh, uh, rich enough uh, hospital or the patient is a rich enough patient uh, then we use stapler especially at the say renal pedicle at the splenic pedicle so we use stapler so the staplers have got different types of cartridges depending on the thickness of the tissue the white one is usually used for vascular stapling the rest are used for different types of bowel or the lung okay so those are the things so stapling also there are many types of staplers you we started off using manual staplers rigid straight then we had uh, flexible tip the staplers could flex that was very good we could go deep into the pelvis or you know and do anastomosis we could go into the chest and do anastomosis okay then we started getting motorized and flexed 
okay so the the the, the, the technology of stapling also has improved so my advice nowadays is uh, to try to do uh, use uh, the the powered staplers okay doesn't matter the make powered staplers uh, and flexible ones uh, where the ends can con uh, flex and you can use power so less jag uh, jarring when you apply stapling because sometimes this jarring motion when you are applying the 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 firing the stapler can cause a tear of tissue and may result in leak okay so power stapler if you can unless uh, you are going to use one time firing okay uh, so the other instruments uh, sorry yeah other instruments uh, usually use suction irrigation not much changes in uh, in terms of technology smoke filters are something new and largely used uh, during the era of uh, covid this is requ uh, requirement now uh, by mo most uh, surgical colleges retractors are very important especially if you are doing uh, surgery in deep cavities okay uh, and the extraction bags sometimes you need various sizes you cannot have one size which fits all so i think it's self explanatory okay so this is uh, what the smoke filter looks like so in summary uh, instruments are excellent adjuncts to surgeons armamentarium okay but they don't make the surgeon uh, you are the surgeon you have to decide which instrument you, you require using the best instrument does not make you the best surgeon okay the outcome of your surgery is still your surgeon dependent okay and you are responsible to learn safe laparoscopy and navigate your learning curve yourself okay be criticize yourself more than others criticize you and know that conversion is not a failure now my take home message is choose your patient carefully if you're going to do mis prepare them thoroughly okay operate consistently do the same thing every time and you'll get better don't keep changing your tactics and then after surgery when you have done all this you just watch your patient masterfully you don't have to do anything they will recover themselves of course there are a few things like ambulation and this and that medication and all your things and to make sure your quality doesn't suffer always audit yourself so that is my talk thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much vimal our uh, next uh, lecturer uh, would be uh, giving a lecture on advanced uh, exposure and uh, dissection uh, techniques. Uh, he is... Uh, hello. He is the chair of the uh, Philippine uh, Center for Advanced uh, Laparoscopic Surgery. He is uh, the program director of the uh, Unified Minimal Invasive uh, Surgery Training Program, and he is the uh, past president of the uh, ELSA, uh, uh, Dr. Allen uh, Buenafe. Hi, good me. evening, uh, Dr. Allen. Uh, good evening. Hi, hi, for me. Hi, Vimal, uh, Jimmy, Ray, and everyone. Hi. Arlene, hello. Hello, Let hello. Me... <laughs> hey, brother. Hi, Vimal. <laughs> It's hey, been so man. long. <laughs> Jimmy, <laughs> how are you? I'm good. I'm doing good. Thank you. Mm. Where's my lecture? Let's start. Let me share. I don't know how to share. Wait. You see it now? Yes, uh, we can see the bar. Yes, sir. We can see it. Sorry, the computer is new, so I have to <laughs> unlock everything up. So anyway, <clears throat> I would like to thank first the organizers of the uh, Upper Gastro International Surgeon Society uh, of Asia. Thank you very much for the kind invitation, uh, Jimmy, and of course Dumal uh, for the kind invitation. And my, my topic for tonight is about advanced exposure and, and uh, dissection techniques. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any disclosure. So the topic is about advanced exposure and 
there's suction techniques, especially for upper GI surgeries. So like in all surgeries that we do, it's about setting the stage for us to have a successful procedure uh, on how we do it. So the uh, setting up the stage for a successful dissection and exposure would really be dependent on instrumentation, uh, like what uh, Vimal, my good friend Vimal, have said earlier in his lecture. And a lot of these things are quite procedure specific. Uh, Vimal has uh, been doing a lot of uh, bariatric surgery, then definitely your instrumentation should be uh, more adept for uh, an, a bariatric surgery. And also uh, that, that uh, instrumentation would uh, be dependent on how you would use your each instruments. So retraction um, of all these uh, intra-abdominal organs uh, can be done either by the by, by your instruments or by using your gravity to help you out in trying to dissect everything up. Port placement would uh, make or break on how you would do your dissection and your exposure. So you have to have a specific idea of what procedure you would want to do on your uh, on your patient, especially if you're doing a certain type of uh, upper GI procedure, then you have to think of ways on how you would want to place that uh, ports uh, just to be able to be able to uh, place in your instrumentation and be able to dissect uh, properly. Traction and counter traction uh, is very important also. We all know that even in open surgery, uh, the, a good principle of traction and counter-traction would spell a successful uh, dissection or a bloody dissection at that. So I think these are the things that we need to look at and we need to uh, take note of every time we would want to do a laparoscopic uh, surgery. In the same manner, even though we're doing it laparoscopically now, uh, in the open procedure, in open surgery, it's the same thing. Uh, you would want to set the stage for you to have a successful uh, dissection and exposure of uh, the organs. We have to remember that your assistant in open surgery, you have the benefit of having two or three or more assistants to help you in trying to expose and trying to dissect the, the, the area. But then again, you as the surgeon would have to set the stage for everyone for, for you to be able to expose a, to have a proper exposure of the things that you would want to dissect. So it's all about setting the stage for yourself and setting the stage for you to be successful in doing your uh, surgery. So in, in this lecture, uh, we'll be showing you some uh, procedures, some videos on how we would expose uh, different types of uh, upper GI procedures. Uh, that we would normally do from esophageal, gastric, uh, basically uh, more of trying to expose that hiatal area, uh, exposure of that uh, gastric area and trying to dissect uh, on all those things. So different types of instruments, uh, you would need different types of instruments for different uh, procedures, but then again, uh, because of the skills and the experience that we have uh, gained through the years of doing surgery, doing laparoscopic surgery, uh, you tend to favor some, some instruments. Uh, and these are the instruments that would usually uh, normally uh, make use of uh, during the course of uh, other, other surgeries. When Vimal, uh, just for a... A, a, for the information of everyone, uh, Vimal and I actually started doing laparoscopic surgery almost uh, at the same time. We were classmates uh, during the early 2000s when we were taught on how to do laparoscopic colon surgery. I think that was in Shanghai, Vimal, right? Uh, then, then after that, uh, we would share and would uh, go to each country 
for us to you know, do lectures and do live surgeries together. But you have, as a surgeon, you would have certain preferences for instruments. Uh, like for me, uh, I, I love using a uh, proteome instrument, but some other uh, hospitals or some other uh, institutions doesn't have that, uh, that doesn't have the instruments. But some of these instruments are actually can, can be used uh, from uh, two other uh, procedures like your bariatric surgeries. But then again, you have to think of, especially with bariatric surgery, you have to think of the length of your instrument. Some other instruments are not suitable uh, to use in other procedures. So these are the things that you would want to look at. Uh, doing your, uh, especially for liver retraction, uh, it would help if you have your snake retractors or your Nathan, uh, Nathan Stone retractor. Uh, if you don't have it, there are other ways and means of uh, being able to for, for you to be able to uh, retract that lever, and I'll show you later on some uh, some procedures on how we would do it. But it, it's it's nice to note uh, that there are some other instruments. Like when we first started, we don't have the uh, benefit of having your Nathanson retractor, your snake retractor. So it would make use of our normal instruments like a grasper with a ratchet on it and a lock. Uh, we grab hold, we, we grab and take hold of that hiatal area. And usually it's the right bruise and then try to dissect and try to retract that lever upwards just for you to be able to do your work at the gastric area and preventing that lever to go down and cover up the gastric area. So these are the small things that uh, we would uh, do early on during the surgery, during the early times of uh, laparoscopic surgery. But still nowadays, people would, would, uh, would do some uh, variations in trying to retract that uh, liver. And we'll show you some videos later on. So this is how we would make use of the snake, snake retractor. Uh, it's called a snake liver retractor, actually. So it's a uh, malleable thing at, at the end of the instrument where you can close it up by turning clockwise. Then it becomes a stiff triangular shape uh, or even an octagonal shape uh, retractor, which you can make use of trying to lift that uh, lever. Uh, we would usually make use of this one during uh, if you're doing your uh, gastric surgeries, like for uh, bariatric surgery or even for uh, D2 dissections for gastric cancers. Nathan's thunder tractor uh, is usually done by placing a five millimeter trocar at the epigastric area and removing that trocar again and placing your Nathanson retractor through the trap uh, that your five millimeter trocar uh, uh, has created initially during the, the section. Uh, all of these things, regardless if it's uh, the snake liver retractor or the Nathanson retractor, you have to do it under uh, direct vision. Mind you, uh, the Nathanson retractor looks like a very benign instrument, but there's a lot of uh, reports also uh, that were reported, especially during the early days of uh, bariatric surgery, where that end of your uh, Nathanson retractor uh, was able to puncture that uh, uh, cardiac area, and, uh, creating a a liver a, a, an injury to that cardiac area. So be very careful in trying to uh, place that uh, uh, Nathanson retractor. One way of trying to do your uh, liver retraction is to make use of that uh, suture, a transfascial suture, uh, where you can pass a, a monofilament suture uh, transfascially, and you'll be able to create a retraction. Uh, the reason why we make use of a suture retraction, we're doing a, I think this is a GIST procedure that we've done uh, using a single port 
uh, instrumentations. Uh, just a single port, uh, one small incision of the umbilical area. And to help us uh, retract, uh, with, with the retraction, we make use of uh, monofilament uh, sutures just to be able to open it up. One way of uh, creating also is your placement of a suture uh, anchored on the uh, crura, on, on the right cruise. Uh, some surgeons would actually do a transhepatic uh, uh, suturing. You pass on a straight needle or a schist needle through that liver and do an anchoring, a transfacial anchor. Uh, but because of incidences of bleeding and being cumbersome, I opt not to do it. I've tried it before, but I like this one better, uh, which is more atraumatic than a passage of a kiss needle through that uh, left lobe of the liver. So this is how we do it and placement of a gauze uh, just to protect the liver. You have to remember, if you're using a monofilament uh, suture like this one, uh, I think this is a proline suture that we've uh, used. Uh, it can be traumatic and can cause some injury to your left liver. So you have to protect that liver either by placement of a uh, rubber drain uh, passed on through that uh, uh, suture or a placement of a simple uh, gauze uh, to protect the uh, deliver from the suture, uh, like so. So we would put that suture in between the, uh, we would put the gauze, operating gauze in between the suture and the liver just to be able to protect the liver and lifting it up for you to open that uh, rural area. So this is the cruise, this is a hiatal hernia and we would want to dissect that area. So a transfacial uh, plural suture was placed uh, to be able to lift that liver up. In any case, in, in a lot of procedures, you can do this actually if you don't have your snake retractors or your uh, Nathanson retractor. So it's usually a surgeon's preference on how you would want uh, to uh, retract that liver. Uh, although we have snake retractors or uh, Nathanson retractors, sometimes we'd like to show this one uh, just to help our fellows uh, have the idea of how they'll be able to uh, retract that liver if they don't have the uh, right instrumentation. The other simpler one actually to be able to retract the liver is to pass through an epigastric port uh, in through car, a five millimeter grasper, you can grasp your crural area and lock it up. Once you've locked that instrument, uh, you'll have now a, an effective uh, retraction of that lever going upwards just by the usage of your uh, simple uh, laparoscopic instrument. Uh, for trocar placement, uh, it would be really dependent on what procedure uh, you're doing. And of course, the habitus of your patient, if you have a morbidly obese patient, you would rather have your first, uh, the, the optical placement, the optical port placement, a little bit higher than your umbilical port. Uh, even for... Uh, Hiatal dissections, you would want to do your optical part rather than placement of that optical part at the umbilical area. It would go a little bit lateral to the left just to be able to have a direct line of uh, view to your esophagus. You have to remember that your esophagus is not at the midline. It's more on the uh, left lateral side of, that, uh, of the patients. If you have a trocar placed on a left-sided, more left-sided placement of uh, that optical port, you'll be able to have a direct view of that hiatal area. Uh, then you won't have any uh, crisscrossing of your instruments and fighting of that, infighting of your instruments uh, intra-abdominally. So these are the things that you would want to 
take note of prior to doing the surgery, I would make a mental, uh, I, I would think first on how I would, what would want to run my procedure uh, during the surgery. So mentally, I would think of how I would place my trocar placement. But of course, with respect to uh, also the length, you know, uh, also the width uh, in between your trocars, just for you not to be able to have a infighting of trocars uh, in club dominantly. So again, port placement is done under direct vision. If I'm doing a uh, gastric surgery for uh, cancer, I would place my camera at the umbilical area and the curvilinear placement of uh, two bilateral instrumentations. Uh, positioning is also a good, uh, good idea on uh, how you would want to set the stage for yourself. Uh, I'll show you later on how we would uh, position our patient. I would usually put my patient in a modified Lloyd Davis. Then depending on the procedure, I would rather stand either in the middle of the legs of the patient or on the right side of the patient. So modified, uh, this is how we call, we call it, the modified Lloyd Davis position, where the patient is uh, placed supine with the legs downwards. You have to remember that the legs of the patient should be at least parallel to the body of the patient. The reason for that is if your leg is a little bit higher than the, the body of your patient, when you're doing your surgery, uh, you have to remember that the instruments uh, that you're using is quite long. And you have to have a good space in between that leg and the hands of the surgeon. So you don't want that leg to be uh, obscuring or to be bumping through the, the hands of uh, the patient. Depending on the procedure, upper GI procedure that you would want to do, uh, the surgeon would either stand on the right side of the patient in between the legs of the patient or the left side of the patient. Uh, in, in majority of our upper GI surgeries, be it uh, for gastric cancer, for hiatal surgeries, uh, I would stay always in the middle of the in the middle of the leg of the patient for, for me to be able to have a better view and a better <clears throat> approach on, on, the, uh, on the different uh, uh, positions of the patient. So comparing all the retraction uh, from your snake retractors, cruel retractor, and your needle grasp retractor, uh, uh, the needle grasper method is the easiest method wherein you would just insert a either a grasper with a lock, a ratcheted grasper, uh, grab that crura. Usually it's the right cruise. Once you've grabbed that right cruise, you just place it there and then you'll have an effective uh, retraction of that lever upwards and exposing your uh, crural area. So for uh, advanced dissection, uh, depending on which side you are dissecting, you have to have a good grasp of the anatomy, the surgical planes of each, uh, of each area, especially at the plural area. I mean, if you're working with a huge hiatal hernia, you have to remember the anatomy of each uh, plane, surgical plane. Uh, the reason for that is it's easier actually to cross the surgical plane, and you'll, uh, you'll open up the pleural area. Although it, there's not much of a complication, even if you've opened up the pleural area, but you have to have a good grasp of each surgical plane. Working on the gastric area, you have to take note of the different surgical planes also. So just to show you on how we do it, uh, you can make use of a Penrose drain rather than holding it with an instrument here. Uh, this is now your esophagus. Uh, the assistant is uh, holding the gastric area. 
I think this is for uh, gastric cancer. I'm not uh, sure it's the fellows who did the uh, yeah. This is for gastric cancer. So the section is done. Uh, that's the esophagus now. Rather than holding your stomach uh, uh, from your fellow or from your resident, you can actually run a Penrose drain across that, uh, uh, that esophageal area. And you can take hold, uh, take hold of that Penrose drain and for you to be able to open up the uh, hiatal area. So this is now the left cruise. So take note of the left hand, the right hand actually of the assistant. It opens up the left hiatus for you to be able to have a good view of that hiatal area. So the section is done. This is now your retroplural area. This is your esophagus being dissected. So in the same manner, if you're doing your achalasia or even for your uh, dissection for your uh, for duplications, you would want to lengthen that esophagus. The, the steps are basic and are repeatable. Uh, in a lot of uh, procedures, be it, your, be it for achalasia, be it for uh, hiatal hernias, be it for, uh, for duplication procedures, or even for your gastric cancers, gas gastric cancer procedures. So these are repeatable uh, uh, procedures that you can actually learn through time. So just to show you, uh, how we do also our dissection. So this is a Heller's myotomy with from duplication. I think the door from duplication. So the section, because it's just a Heller's myotomy, you would just want to open the anterior uh, uh, portion of that crura. So the section is done to be able to identify that surgical plane in between your cruise, the left and the right cruise, and of course, your esophagus, you don't want to injure that esophageal uh, uh, tissue. Then obviously, once you've done your dissection, you would want to do your mediastinal uh, dissection. So if you can take note of, even though if you're deep inside your hiatus, uh, hiatus because of the placement of the trocar, the first optical trocar, the placement which is a little bit on the left side, when you put your, your telescope forward through that, uh, looking through your hiatus, you're actually looking straight. Uh, obviously, we're using a 30 degree telescope or even a 45 degree telescope. Uh, although a 45 degree telescope uh, takes a lot of time to uh, be confident uh, using or be comfortable using. Uh, in, in the same manner that uh, you, you need to have a, a practice on how you would want to use your 30 degree telescope. But you have to look at this one. You're actually looking straight through that hiatal area. Unlike if your placement of that optical trocar is way on the midline, uh, trying to look on that hiatal area would be quite difficult. So you need to set the stage uh, for you to be able to have a good uh, is actually a good uh, exposure of whatever you uh, exposure area that you would want uh, to have in that upper upper region. So again, the section is carried out uh, just to be able to identify. Then, of course, creating the uh, first the uh, section lines for your uh, esophageal the uh, section or or your may may so always I would carry out my dissection from the G junction, then going up. So I would break down the uh, longitudinal muscle of that esophagus, identifying it layer by layer. Dissection is done. Uh, I think the most important uh, tip that we, that we can give is do your dissection layer by layer, trying to identify all the layers uh, prior to cutting it.
So I think that's the most important uh, uh, tip that we can give, regardless of how, uh, how uh, what procedure you're doing. So do all your dissections layer by layer. So I'll just move this forward in the interest of time. Uh, so that's all for dissection and exposure. Then of course your esophageal dissection. Uh, this one is a, a distal esophageal tumor with involvement of the uh, stomach. So a distal esophagectomy was done on this patient with proximal gastrectomy. Uh, initially, we were thinking of doing a, like how we would do our esophageal surgeries. We would start off with a thoracic approach and go for an abdominal approach. But with this one, uh, we opted to do a, an abdominal approach first, then thoracic, then abdominal, uh, because of uh, the involvement of the uh, of the gastric area was quite what was quite huge, so the the the, the decision on uh, the extent of the uh, the gastric surgery uh, has to be done uh, after exposure of that uh, gastric area. So cruel dissection is done. Uh, the idea is to do a good dissection at the area uh, G. G that's esophageal area. Carried out gastric dissection using your linear stapler, just like the lecture of uh, Virmal earlier. You have to have a good grasp of uh, how you would want to make use of your instruments. So that's the gastric tube that we're planning to bring up. So patient uh, is placed, again, uh, positioning. So prone position. The uh, idea for doing a prone position is the exposure of the esophagus is great. Uh, actually, it's very, very nice uh, once you put the patient on a prone position. So this is now your esophagus. Uh, sorry. Mm-hmm. So I'll just move this here. We'll go to the esophageal space again. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is now your azygous and your esophagus. So the section of that esophageal area, this is now your spine. So the spine is on the superior level uh, of your screen. So the section is done under direct vision, uh, creation of that space in between. So that's the pleura, that's the left side now, left lung. I, uh, I don't know what's happening. Wait. No, it's, it's this one, sorry. Okay, the section is done. So this is now your esophagus. This is the esophagus and this is your spine. So the section is carried out, taking down all the chain of the lymph node and taking down of that azygous. So it's all about a proper exposure and the plane of the section is carried out always on the surgical plane. So I think that's the most important part of the uh, area. So placement, uh, you can make use either of a Penrose drain or just make use of a plain uh, operating gauze uh, to be able for you to retract that esophagus towards you and do your dissection. Uh, transection of that uh, mid esophagus uh, can be done using your stapler. and bringing up that stomach uh, for you to be able to do your 
esophageal uh, reconstruction. Because the tumor was quite huge, I turned the patient again just to be able to help out in trying to reach. Uh, but before doing it, <clears throat> we placed a feeding tube gigantostomy just for us to be able to feed the patient. That's the tumor. Then doing our esophagogastric uh, reconstruction. <clears throat> a side-to-side -side stapler was done uh, in this patient. And after a side-to-side -side stapler was done, then we do our hand sewing. In some, <clears throat> in some of our esophageal surgeries, Sometimes, uh, because <clears throat> the esophagus is quite small, uh, I would end up just suturing the uh, reconstruction. I think it's one of the uh, uh, skills that you need to have uh, if you're doing your procedure. Then, of course, inspecting the anastomotic site uh, by placement of a uh, endoscopy, uh, checking it with endoscopy. So again, trying to have a good idea of the anatomy uh, would greatly help the surgeon in, in doing the exposure and of course in doing your dissection. So I think that's the most important uh, uh, tip that we can give. For gastric surgery, it's uh, together uh, a different uh, matter altogether, especially with your uh, detailed dissections. So you need to have a good grasp of uh, where that, uh, that line of uh, leaf node, on the, the leaf node uh, tree. And of course, a reconstruction. A good reconstruction would require a good exposure of that esophageal area, uh, just for you to, to be able to have a, a good uh, and successful uh, surgery. I think that's the. So, this is just a short video of how we do our uh, gastric uh, cancer surgery with D2 dissection. As uh, what Vimal have said earlier, uh, when we first started, uh, we started off with a jaundiced uh, view of everything. Everything is either reddish because uh, the early uh, uh, machines that we're using are the, uh, I think, the single chip uh, instruments, uh, video systems. So right now, because of the advancement in technology, we have a better uh, appreciation of uh, the anatomy and, of course, the, the different uh, anatomical uh, spaces of uh, the area. So the section will just move this forward in the interest of time. Again, take note of the uh, assistant on how the assistant would expose the area. So you have to have a good teamwork, a good cameraman. It starts off with a very good cameraman. Even if your assistant is just a nurse, uh, which sometimes happens to uh, a lot of us, especially if you're working in a district hospital or a small hospital, you'll end up working with just a nurse or a cameraman nurse or even just a technician uh, to help you out. But knowing what you're doing and how you would want to expose uh, all the uh, anatomical, uh, <coughs> the, the anatomy would greatly help in, in the success of your procedure. So take note of the uh, assistants. So you have your assistant on the left side of the patient that exposes it for you to have a good dissection line. So these are the things that you would want to have just for you to be able to have a good uh, Exposure and dissection. So I just 
think I, I, I think I I'll just move this forward. We don't need to watch the whole procedure. Then the section of the program. So I think that's the end of my uh, lecture uh, for uh, advanced exposure and this section. And I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention. Thank you. For me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Allen, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, We'll have our next uh, lecture uh, in uh, uh, surgical endoscopy. Dr. Canones? Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Ernie Canones, a uh, surgical endoscopist from the Zao Medical Center in Manila, Philippines. And uh, I am tasked tonight to introduce you the next lecture. So he is a surgical endoscopist and an upper GI surgeon who has his training in Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he is currently the head of the minimally invasive and robotics center at the uh, St. Luke's Medical Center at BGC and currently the chairman of the Department of Surgery and the head of um, surgical endoscopy and MIS center and the compatibility center at our institution, Rizal Medical Center. Uh, he founded the only surgical endoscopy and MIS training program in the Philippines, and proudly, I have been trained, uh, personally trained by him. Indeed, the knight of the knife and the snake charmer of the scope, it is an honor to present to you my boss, Dr. Ray Sarmiento. Uh, thank you, Arlene, for that uh, introduction. Uh, uh, I was just amazed by the snake charmer of the endoscope, but uh, anyway, I hope uh, I can deliver this lecture uh, as to how Vermi was able to, uh, how Vermi, Dr. Vermi Garcia asked me to go around the theme of uh, basics, going back to the basics and then uh, how to do surgical endoscopy uh, in terms of uh, instrumentation, uh, dissection, and exposure. When I got the invitation, I said, uh, this is a very difficult topic because it's very difficult for me as a surgical endoscopist to talk about uh, instrumentation and exposure and dissection in endoscopy because uh, it's, uh, it's very straightforward when you put down the scope, you'll be able to see most of the things that you'd like to see inside. But of course, when you do a little bit of advanced endoscopic or therapeutic endoscopy, then uh, uh, you will be you will be needed you will be needing a little bit of uh, technology to help you with regards to uh, exposure and dissection. So let me uh, share my, my slides. Can you see it? Is yes, it on uh, screen already? Yes, it's already on screen, Doctor. All right. Okay. Uh, I'd like to also thank the Tugs Asia uh, for inviting me or having me here. Okay. I have nothing to disclose at the moment. And the lecture outline will be, I'll be dealing with the anatomy of the scope, some types of endoscopes, instrumentation and accessories, preparation and positioning of patients, and uh, some pointers on endoscope handling, and then just go through some scenic clinics or videos on therapeutic endoscopy to highlight the first slide uh, in terms of instrumentation and accessories. So these are my sources. So with minimally invasive surgery, we all know that this is a discipline in surgery that crosses all specialties, involving general surgery down to pediatric surgery, down to thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. 
to us, uh, it is not a specialty in itself, but uh, philosophy, a way of life for us surgeons doing uh, minimally invasive surgery. And minimally invasive surgery can be more or less uh, divided into two. Laparoscopic surgery, as, uh, uh, as, you have, as you have seen with the two lecturers previous to me, and uh, also endoscopy. Uh, the other one using a rigid scope, and the other one is using a flexible endoscope and an imaging system. So what is endoscopy? Well, the etymology is uh, endo and scopy, uh, meaning internal and observation or viewing of something that is internal, or more or less viewing of internal organs using an endoscope. And initially, we had the fiber optic endoscope, but has evolved at present uh, to a video endoscope with very, very uh, nice resolution or video capturing resolution or images that we can see on screen already. We can even magnify uh, the images down to the cellular level. So talking about surgical endoscopy, it's a surgeon doing endoscopy, and uh, basically, uh, as surgeons, we do have the basic surgical knowledge, the clinical aptitude to do surgery, of course, the technical skills, and the right attitude to be able to uh, treat patients with surgical diseases. And these technical skills can be summarized into um, the section or excision hemostasis or vessel ligation, tissue cutting, and tissue approximation, or creation of a biologic cylinder. That's usually how we summarize what we do as surgeon, if you're going to think about it. And this is usually inherent to us being surgeon. And we usually do that with our bare gloved hand. But using the platform of the endoscope, and be able to translate dissection, hemostasis, tissue cutting, and tissue approximation to treat surgical diseases is, might be the main encompassing feature or main encompassing definition of surgical endoscopy. So we'd like to treat surgical diseases using the platform of the endoscope. So I was given the task, the task of basic endoscopy, but Rather than going to the basic endoscopy part, I'd like to go to the basics of endoscopy. And the basics of endoscopy involves the instruments and accessories. And uh, to go into the instrumentation or the instruments is uh, to go into the anatomy of the scope or the flexible endoscope. It is divided into four, the control head with valves, the shaft or the insertion tube, the bending section, and the universal cord or what we call the umbilical cord. So this is how it is schematically, uh, uh, how the four parts go to each other, the umbilical cord or the universal cord attaches itself to the light source and uh, video processor, and then that's projected to your screen or your monitors. And then the insertion tube is the one that goes through the lumen or the oral cavity or the anal, cavity, uh, anal opening down to the uh, organ that you'd like to observe. And the bending section uh, helps us, uh, aids the endoscopist to see different parts of the GI tract. Of course, uh, uh, there's uh, 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 lenses at the tip of the scope and then uh, CCDs or to be able to interpret or be able to uh, relay the images to the uh, video processor. So uh, basically this is the same image. So the control body or the area wherein the knobs are in also have switches wherein you can uh, enhance or uh, different shape areas were in, uh, I mean, you can press buttons to be able to see different things inside the, in your monitor. There is also the air and water valves and the suction valve. 
and also the biopsy area or the biopsy valve or biopsy port. So uh, the, the switches can be programmable and the one on top is the suction valve here. The one below is the air water valve. And then this is the control unit. And there are brakes for you to be able to lock the knobs. The bigger knob uh, controls the up down movement of the bending section and the smaller knob, the left and right angulation of the bending tip of the scope. So at the tip of the scope, uh, an end viewing scope uh, wherein the light and lens are in one plane at the tip, at the flat plane of the endoscope also comes out the biopsy or the biopsy forceps or any instrument coming out of the biopsy channel. There's also an air water jet there that washes off the screen and the lens. And uh, this is being compared to a side viewing scope on your right side, wherein the light and lens comes on the lateral side of the endoscope. So mainly the side viewing scope is the one used for ERTP or endoscopic retrograde for larger pancreatography. And the end viewing scope is the one being used mostly on our gastroscope or our uh, lower GI endoscopes. So uh, again, another image of that. And now we go to the instruments involved uh, or the instrumentation that the instrument or accessories that we use uh, uh, in surgical endoscopy. So deep, there are different types of endoscopes. Uh, depending on the length, the diameter, channel size, and other features of each scope. The channel size usually ranges from two to 4.8 millimeters. Once uh, it's, four, it's uh, above 3.8, we call that a therapeutic scope already, and then anything with a lower diameter, it's a diagnostic scope. So gastroscope used to evaluate the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum, uh, colonoscope, of course, the colon and the ileum, and duodenoscope uh, for ERTPs, and the cholangioscope for biliary endoscopy. Uh, other scopes, like the echo endoscopes are available. Uh, there's a neutral sound on the tip. Uh, mostly, they, they are oblique viewing, but Olympus has an end viewing uh, linear echo endoscope. And of course, there are other special types of scopes like the single balloon or double balloon. I'll show you pictures later while, as we go on into the uh, next, uh, uh, as we go into the uh, lectures. Now, with regards to preparation and patient positioning, we usually uh, place the patient uh, no food, no water, especially for upper GI endoscopy six to eight hours prior to each procedure. And of course, a bowel preparation for a colon procedure. And uh, there are certain setups with regards to having the endoscope and the monitors or the X-ray or fluoroscopes, as you can see here in the picture. In the picture. Uh, we usually place our patient under ETGA, especially for uh, therapeutic ones, especially for our ESCP. But in some procedures, we do them uh, under sedation. So your upper GI endoscopy is usually done on a left lateral position. And then for your lower GI endoscopy, the patient is facing away from you on a left lateral position. For ERCPs, you have the patient on prone. Uh, these were the times uh, you see pictures on the right where in it was very difficult to do these procedures under PPEs. The assistant is on your right side or on the back side of your of the surgeon. And this is how you hold the scope. The umbilical cord is tethered under or under the arm, within the arm, not outside the arm, to be able to have more control for that. And now um, these are just examples of uh, uh, endoscopes. Uh, there are different... Uh, uh, industry partners providing for endoscope. We have Olympus, Fujinon, and Pentax. 
And uh, basically, this is how it would look like uh, the knobs, the suction valves, the brakes, the biopsy part, the umbilical cord, and uh, this is the control unit or the control head. This is the tip or the bending unit. And this is usually how a gastroscope would look like. And a colonoscope, of course, has a longer insertion tube, uh, usually 1.6 to 1 to 2.0 meters in length, I uh, 2.0 meters in depth. And a side viewing scope, a uh, do dinner scope wherein there's an elevator. Uh, once the, you put in an instrument down into that, you'll be able to control how the instrument uh, goes up or down. You'll be able to manipulate your catheters inside the GI tract to cannulate the papilla of water. A closer look, you can see how old our scopes are and how uh, used they are, but uh, still serves us uh, very well. As mentioned by Professor Bimal earlier, you should be able to take care of your instrument. So uh, maintenance is uh, key in terms of scopes. This is a spyglass, a small scope, a 10 French uh scope that can be used uh, independently as a scope or part of a mother baby uh, scope system for uh, biliary endoscopy. I'll show you some videos later. This is how an echo endoscope would look like, a linear echo endoscope. Uh, this is only the echo endoscope that we use in our unit uh, because uh, having that radio, radial echo endoscope and other intraductal echo endoscope uh, might be very expensive for the unit to be to buy. So there are specialized scopes. Uh, these are double balloons. Uh, uh, there are uh, just one or two units available in the whole country. Single balloon and their scopes. Uh, these are scopes that we use to reach a small bowel or the uh, more distant part of the GI tract. And then a spiral over tube. Uh, this is just a, a, uh, how it looks like. Uh, this turns the small bowel into the spiral, and then you'll be able to go down the small bowel. Uh, Olympus has a me mechanized uh, spiral over tube or spiral scope or spiral spiroscope. So this is how the spy scope would generally look like. If, uh, we use this spyglass polangioscope. It has uh, ports for water, in, in, water, water jets and uh, a small port for laser, wherein we put it out for laser leakages. Just an animation on how a spy system or spy scope would look like. You put in uh, the spy scope through your using scope and then be able to visualize the biliary tree can be done to di uh, do some diagnostic evaluation or be able to do some stone lithotripsy with the help of a home neum laser. <laughs> so it's a video how uh, a spyglass or a mother baby scope system would look like. Uh, how clear the image is so that you'll be able to do uh, here uh, in this video particularly is a bioduct structure so we're going to biopsy that and then of course bypass the area after uh, evaluating Uh, there's specialized, specialized scopes like the 2T scopes, there are two channels, usually used for GI beaters, but also used as part of the overstitch uh, 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 endoscopic suturing device. I'll show you some videos later for this. And then other scopes like the Saneso, where in this is a colonoscope that has 360 degrees view of the colon to increase your polyp detection rate. 
just to show you an image, but it's not available in our country. So an ES scope would be able to give you an image of the CBD pancreatic duct and uh, can actually use these uh, images for intervention of uh, EUS. And also evaluate mainly the pancreas and all other organs uh, around the area. So this is how an EUS uh, with a regional echoendoscope would look like. And of course, an intraductal echoendoscope, where you can put in uh, the echoendoscope inside the BDRG and evaluate the depth of uh, invasion of tumors or evaluate the areas around the mantle. Other, uh, other parts of the of surgical endoscopy would be some catheters or accessories. Uh, the, the needle is very important for us because we need the needle to inject our submucosal fluid cushion uh, with uh, either using hyaluronic acid, which is uh, very expensive here. We just have to source it out from Japan. So we use saline or saline with adrenaline or HPNC or uh, the ones that the ophthalmologists would use for their big gel surgery. So the purpose is to deassociate the mucosa from the muscle layer and to be able sub to be able to do some mucosal space endoscopy or third space endoscopy. Other instruments, uh, the needle knife, a hook knife. Uh, of course, it's just like a needle knife shaped like a hook, like a hook that we use in laparoscopic surgery. And this one is an insulated tip knife. There's a porcelain at the tip, but uh, you're able to uh, cut uh, with the needle in between. Uh, the porcelain tip is to protect the other side or the organs too close or you don't want to, an organ that you don't want to burn. So it's an insulated tip knife. Another one is the triangle tip knife. So basically the IT knife is like a TT knife that just has a porcelain at its tip. A dual knife, a short needle at the tip we use usually in endoscopic submucosal dissection and endoscopic uh, to take out early gastric lesions or air lesions in the esophagus or even in the colon. Uh, just like your dual knife, uh, Irby has a specialized uh, uh, needle knife uh, wherein uh, the injection happens also through this uh, uh, knife. Instruments like the clutch cutter can be used to uh, help you aid in cutting uh, tissues for endoscopic semicosal dissection. And of course, clips for hemostasis or even closing uh, perforations or intended perforation, accidental or intended. Of course, uh, for as I mentioned earlier, we can do some hemostasis, we use coil graspers. And uh, for exposure, we use caps. These are placed at the tip of the scope. And other forms of caps, like uh, the boogie cap uh, by Ovesco and the OTG excavator, I'll show you. Uh, well, uh, I'll mention earlier where this OTSG excavator is used, but mainly the boogie cap is used to dilate some strictures, especially short segment strictures in the upper GI tract. So I'll show you the use of the cap. Uh, the cap on the scope of uh, uh, on the tip of the scope. Uh, this is an appendectomy patient or a patient who has appendicitis, and uh, we're doing colonoscopy and endoscopic retrograde appendicitis therapy. So you see the appendicial lumen, and you can see the use of the cap of this cap to be able to see the valves of Gerlach and be able to identify the appendicial opening. You see the pus coming out of the appendix, and we'll do some appendicography and check uh, if it's just a stricture inside the appendix or there's an appendiculite, but ma mainly before we enter, we know it's already an appendiculite or just an enlarged lymph node because we have a CT scan prior to this.
Uh, this can be very controversial, this procedure, but uh, I would just like to show you uh, the use of the cap. Uh, now you see the appendicular coming out of the appendix. And uh, we now place a stent just to relieve the pressures inside the appendix and then basically send these patients home a day or two after uh, ERAT or ERAT. Another video where in uh, you would see that we will use the different knives uh, as I've shown earlier and even the creation of the submucosal fluid cushion to be able to do what we call now endoscopic submucosal dissection. So the instruments that uh, the instrumentation and the accessories that I showed earlier is uh, a lot easier to understand or grasp when you see the procedure being done. So this is a dual knife. There's a short needle at the tip, and we mark the area. And then uh, there's a cap also used to uh, help us visualize. The area, and now we do some cutting. To be able to dissect the tumor, that uh, small tumor, away from the submucosal area. Along with this is the part of the mucosa. You may elect not to close the mucosa defect, uh, but I'll just show you also how the hemoclip is being used to close mucosal defects. So we just put it there and close it and do a series of clipping to be able to close the defect. And now, um, uh, Dr. Benefe showed you the laparoscopic way to treat a patient with achalation. Now we'll show you uh, a combined method of uh, doing endoscopic and laparoscopic treatment for Achalasia. So we do the peroral endoscopic myotomy by doing some mucosal tunneling. So we use a scope with a cap, a needle injecting a submucosal fluid cushion. So to de associate the mucosa away from the muscular area. And then we will do some cutting with a hook knife. And so we can do a mucosa, I mean, we can go through or inside the mucosa into the submucosal space. So we call that the mucosal entry site. And dissect with an insulated tip, a triangular tip, it depends on the preference of the endoscopist, and create that tunnel, that submucosal tunnel. We can do hemostasis also down into the stomach area. Around one, around two to three centimeters beyond the G junction. And after that, we can now, uh, since we have the submucosal tunnel, we, uh, in this, in this part, we know that we're in the G junction because you can see these palisading vessels. So we try to steer away from those vessels and go beyond that and go into the stomach. Now you know in this, you're in the stomach because you're going through a tight area and then everything becomes loose. And then we double check by going in and out of the submucosal tunnel and into the lumen of the GI tract and be able to see the, the, tunnel in, uh, the tunnel that has gone into the stomach already. So we're still following the rules or the principles of the, the section for accolation. Uh, and then uh, the mucosal entry site is around 10, 10 centimeters above the G junction. And then we try to do the tunnel down into the stomach. Now we do specifically uh, here, I do a full thickness myotomy. I don't have uh, 
that finer skills to be able to do just the circular muscles. Uh, if you notice, it is also important uh, that uh, you are very familiar with settings of your ESU or your electrosurgical unit to be able to do uh, easier dissection uh, in some areas. Now we close the mucosa defect after the myotomy. And then after the poem, uh, our rationale, because since we do, we're doing poem and there's a high risk of uh, reflux and patients who have uh, uh, after poem around 40% of them, we will turn the patient or we will go for uh, laparoscopy to do our door or modified door from duplication. Now you see that the G junction is quite open. Now we go for our, now you see that full thickness myotomy done by the uh, OM. Uh, I don't do much dissection in the hiatal area. And we'll just do a modified door by attaching that portion of the stomach into the right tooth. And uh, you can see my liver retractor is only a suction, just to be able to give me space. And then I'm done. Now, other instruments uh, are just, you know, uh, just expensive, but uh, can be used. Uh, some retractors or graspers, clips and strings, magnets, uh, to be able to help you expose the area where you want to be, especially when you're doing uh, endoscopic some because of this section. Now for the part wherein we say that we do a uh, biologic cylinder or tissue approximation or creation of a biologic cylinder, the, in endoscopy, mainly we do that through the use of a uh, self expanding metallic scent or be able to create a re reopen up that biologic cylinder. They are mainly uh, consist of methanol and titanium uh, material and expands uh, by itself uh, to a diameter that is uh, uh, adequate for passage of food or feces. Just a, a, a representation of how enteral stenting happens. So, and then it is deployed to reopen that biologic tube. Mainly used for palliation in esophageal cancer, gastric ulcerative obstruction, colorectal cancer. It can be used to treat some surgical complications like strictures, leaks, or disruptions, or even fistulas or enterocutaneous fistulas. So it can uh, be either uncovered, fully covered, or partially covered. But uh, I think uh, this can be covered by a different lecture. Now, other equipment or instruments like the over-the-scope caps, dilators, or even what we call ovesco clamps, uh, they are mainly used for hemostasis, but can also be used to close some uh, intended or accidental mucosal defects. Uh, this is how they look like. And other... Uh, instrumentation that uh, can be used for tissue approximation or creation of cylinders can be uh, now these endoscopic suturing devices like the Apollo overstitch, wherein a uh, stitching device is attached to the endoscope and you'll be able to close defects, uh, make uh, a dilated uh, tube a little bit tighter especially in bariatric surgery, where in this dilatation of your uh, anastomosis between your gastric stump and your jejunum. Uh, another way to close defects or do approximation would be using the Apollo X-Pack or the Helix packing system. 
wherein you bury a helix type of a device and leave it there, may just like the way we do uh, tacking for a hernia. And then there's a protein stitch attached to it, and then you just pull it all together to approximate the defect. Now, uh, other videos uh, of uh, a self-expanding metallic stand being inserted to bypass a biliary structure. Now we are able to drain something that is obstructed. Another video showing you a patient who had sleeve gastrectomy but uh, there are so many connections into the other parts of the abdomen, a fistula into the splenic area, fistula outside the stomach. And then, of course, there's a portion that only connects a small, a small tube or a small tract that only connects to the remnant stomach. And we can... Uh, Place some metal stent to be able to cover the fistula and be able to connect, reconnect that esophagus to the stomach. Another video showing you uh, complications arising from bariatric surgery and being treated by uh, in what we now call the mega stent or the stent that we usually place for leaks associated with bariatric surgery. But uh, here you can see how the Ovesco clamp is being used. So there's a fistulous uh, track or connection. You can see that uh, you can actually see some staplers there. And uh, that clamp or the Vesco clamp uh, is able to grasp the area and uh, put pressure and close it. Uh, but we are going to still place a self expanding metallic stent to be able to address the twisting of the stomach and even the angulation caused uh, by uh, uh, the staple line uh, causing some pr pressures. That's why patients leak at the area near the G junction. We can skip this uh, video in the interest of time. Now, um, this is a video uh, lent to me by Professor uh, Chu, Philip Chu, where in the bleeder, a part of the hemostasis, part of a uh, uh, endoscopist, uh, is being clamped by the Vesco clamp. are being controlled by the Vesco. So the clamp is located here on a cap and being deployed just like your rubber band ligator. And now that the clamp has been, has been deployed, uh, it was able to control the bleed. Same uh, using a uh, vessel clamp to treat the 
a rectovaginal fistula. I was able to identify the opening, do some uh, here, I identify the opening here, and then do some uh, radiographic confirmation. And after that, uh, uh, there's contrast going into the vagina. And this is how it is uh, attached to the scope, the vesco clamp. These were the early days of the vesco. That those three spots should be near the scope. So I was just learning how to use it. And then the fistula is being suctioned into the cap, and then it is being the and uh, now it closes the fistula strap. Uh, let's skip this video. This is a sleeve gastroplasty uh, using the Ovesco. Uh, sorry, the overstitch. Uh, just uh, run through it. Uh, there are markings in the stomach. And the Ovesco is being used to pass sutures to make that stomach a little bit smaller to induce uh, hypomotility of the stomach. Now, um, other ways to create uh, biologic lumen. Now we have uh, endoscopic ultrasound being able to puncture the cyst. Uh, this is a uh, pseudocyst that uh, I did. And um, after puncturing, after seeing the cyst uh, via the ultrasound, uh, puncturing it with a needle, passing in a wire, since we, the lumen opposing metallic set is not available in our country, or it, even if it's available, it's a little bit expensive, we use just a plastic set. And dilate the track and to be able to put multiple stents and just come back later on if this uh, patient will prove to be a uh, world of pancreatic necrosis. And we just come back for re debris mass. Now, as I mentioned, the OTSD excavator can be used to excavate the necrotic tissue, especially after doing that uh, world of necrosis uh, EUS uh, initial uh, access. And then we just come back and excavate uh, dead tissue using this uh, OTSD excavator. Other platforms, uh, a scope having a uh, uh, multiple arms to be able to do some dissection. Uh, it's uh, only things, things that you see uh, on the experimental side, but uh, really it's now available in the market. And the concept is uh, being able to put uh, working arms or working, working uh, robotics or working tips at the tip, uh, arms at the tip of an endoscope. These are prototypes by Professor Chung and Jimmy Tso. And uh, this, this is just a prototype that I show you for historical purposes. So imagine a robot or a working arm at the tip of your endoscope. So this actually changes everything. Now, other applications of uh, endoscopy would be insertion of enteral tubes, but, you know, this application, uh, the application of the scope in surgery is limitless, and uh, these are just uh, some examples. 
like enteral tube insertion, control of bleeders, dilatation of sutures, as mentioned earlier, tenting, and of course, uh, the penultimate of endoscopy is uh, biliary pancreatic endoscopy, but uh, now I think it's more on interventional endoscopic uh, ultrasound. Of course, uh, in lower GI endoscopy, they're the same thing. We control bleeders, polypectomies, and do some uh, dissection or excision of uh, early gas, early tumors, early colonic tumors, or early colonic neoplasia. And then uh, as surgeons doing some innovations in uh, uh, surgical endoscopy. As mentioned earlier, control of bleeders as shown in the videos, dilatations using boogies. Uh, and this is an achalasia patient needing uh, dilatation. We're not able to perform POEM, but this patient will be needing a dilat Sorry, this is not an achalasia patient, but this is an esophageal stricture post-surgical. And we're going to dilate this with a CRE balloon. So uh, the balloon is a controlled radial expansion balloon dilating strictures to be able to create passage ray. And uh, of course for biliary pancreatic endoscopy uh, this is just uh, mostly the most common things that we do, stone extraction and drainage for cholangitis, parasite extraction, uh, uh, stenting for tumors and even staging or even uh, bridging for bridging for prior to surgery uh, in uh, borderline uh, resectable lesions and palliative drainage. Uh, of course, it also, uh, you know, it's a treatment for some uh, bad duck injuries, like your suspect A and B, and uh, of course, facilitation of your cholangioscopy or your pancreatoscopy. And uh, that's the end of my lecture. Thank you for giving uh, time to listen. Uh, thank you very much. Salamat. Uh, Remy? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarmento for a very uh, comprehensive uh, lecture on uh, surgical endoscopy. Uh, we will now proceed to the next segment. So maybe I'll start the uh, ball rolling by giving the first question to uh, some of our uh, lecturers. Uh, Dr. Vimala, you've mentioned uh, regarding the advent now of uh, uh, from uh, two chip to now we have the HD to 4K and now the uh, 3D system. Uh, do you think uh, there is any advantage between using a 4K between uh, and 3D system? And which one do you really prefer uh, uh, doing your surgery with? I think, uh, in my uh, opinion, the Ultra HD is uh, probably the maximum. Uh, uh, resolution we require for good laparoscopic surgery. The 4K uh, is actually uh, a bit of an overkill, like taking machine gun uh, going into the theater, you know, because uh, the resolution of a 4K system is actually designed for large monitors. We are talking about 80 inches and 100 inches monitors, which we never use in the theater. So for the sizes of monitors which we use in the theater, Ultra HD is uh, more than sufficient. However, uh, uh, people like uh, bigger and better stuff, right? So, uh, as regards to whether uh, 2D is better or 3D, if you ask me, I came from an era where, like I, like I said, we started with the halogen uh, and then single chip and three chip uh, and all that. So, uh, to me, it uh, doesn't make much difference between 2D and 3D. But I, I have noticed when I've used the 3D system, uh, that uh, the that the the, the skills uh, I mean uh, the depth of selection definitely much better 
you can do suturing uh, a bit faster okay so all these are very important for those who are starting out in laparoscopy or earlier in their learning curve so for the starters i would recommend a 3d because uh, your learning curve will be shorter uh, and if you have a ultra hd with a, with a 3d it will be ideal okay uh, but not all 3d systems uh, uh, are designed uh, the same as uh, robotics that's why uh, uh there is a bit of limitations you know especially if you are working in the anterior abdominal wall you want to do suturing there you can't really use a 30 degree scope on a 3d i mean recently there are some uh, uh, systems which allow you to flip and all that so the technology is not there yet but it's good for starters uh and then uh, between uh, if you have the the facility to do a, a icg that's an added advantage i think that is where you really need to uh, look at okay yeah thank you uh, professor jimmy do you have uh, questions yeah thank you professor and uh, for a uh, uh, image we we like to higher higher 4k 3d image but for a choka and instrument what's your opinion about the reduced choka surgery like a single pole Oh, the other is a, a opinion about the mini instrument. The instrument uh, size less than three point millimeter. What? What's your comment? Reduce pole and the mini instruments. Thank you for the question. Uh, so again, I go back to my evolution as as a MIS surgeon from the early days. So uh, after having being, I mean, doing the. Uh, normal laparoscopic troca uh, you know multi troca uh, uh, surgery uh, at that time uh, the 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 reduced troca instruments came the single incision one uh, of course there was uh, nodes and all coming about there was a big revolution a lot of things came in uh, i started doing some uh, uh, single uh, reduced troca procedures but i realized that uh, uh, the advantage between open surgery and laparoscopic surgery was very clear and evident but there was not so much difference between uh, multi troca laparoscopy and uh, reduced troca uh, reduced uh, troca uh, laparoscopy okay so there was not much difference and then you had the added disadvantage of having a bigger incision and and the risk which come with a bigger incision okay so that's why i i i felt uh, uh, added cost did not justify the benefit okay and then there was uh, another risk of a bigger incision so i i didn't uh, jump on to the bandwagon of reduced post uh, port surgery so i am not a, a great proponent of it but uh, i agree for for things like the tummies and all that reduced port does uh, a lot of favor yeah uh, then your question about mini so when i was not convinced by the reduced port surgery i started uh, doing a mini laparoscopic surgery so it is still multi port but uh, the instruments are the trocas are very small 3 mm you just need one uh, working maybe 5 mm for your harmonics or whatever so uh, for the last 7 uh, years i have been doing all my ball bladders uh, as mini Uh, laparoscopic colecystectomy uh, so very rarely uh, i've had to convert to conventional laparoscopy and rarely still is a conversion to open surgery so that has been my experience uh, yeah maybe alan can share what his experience is with this uh, same thing uh, also ray and the others thank you vimal uh i'm fond of doing single port actually uh I do all my lab colies on single port. Uh, hernia, TPs are all single port. More so because of uh, patients uh, are the ones requesting it. Uh, primarily because of cosmesis. Uh, by their experience and by my experience, pain, pain uh, perception between four port or a multi port and a single port. is quite small our single ports now are not the single ports that we used to use you used to have before like the uh single port uh single port from 
COVIDian wherein you have at least three centimeter incision in our ports now, you can do away with a, an incision like a 10 millimeter, 10 to 12 uh, uh, port, uh, port size sa the umbilical area. So the size actually is, not, is just the same with a uh, multi-port uh, incision. I think it's more of, it's not a question of uh, are you in favor of a single port, a mini port, or a multi port? It's more of having all of this uh, arm uh, in your armamentarium, where you can mix and match all of this for the advantage of the patient. Uh, up until you'll be able to do a single port safely to your patient, I think that would be acceptable. But if you have a, an increased risk of injury because of you know just trying to finish a single port surgery i think that's uh uh unfair to patients we have to think that what we're after would always be the safety and for the advantage of our patients i would always look on these procedures i i do have many ports in my in my surgery actually in our conversion for single port uh, i think we have a small percentage, three or five percent, when we convert a single port to a multi port, the multi port is actually a mini port. So it gives you the advantage of a better cosmetic result. Uh, pain would always be debatable. Uh, there's a paper actually uh, comparing a single port with a multi port, and it shows no difference. But nowadays, because of a lot of experience on single port, uh, the, 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 the research would say that a single port would have a better uh, pain perception. With regards to the 3D, 4K, and everything, I think there's also a paper that was uh, comparing a, an expert surgeon doing a uh, high-resolution uh, sur surgery and doing surgery on the 3D. There's not much different uh, difference between you know uh, these expert surgeons, but if a novice surgeon uh, does a surgery on a regular two uh, D, uh, even a high resolution two D vision, comparing it to three D, then uh, the, the effect on a three D is better for novice uh, surgeons. I think I think it's more it's more a matter of uh, what are the technologies that we can adopt to our practice for the advantage of our patient? It's not of, we, we all know uh, men being men, sorry for the ladies, but also ladies would love to have big boys. <laughs> it's like big boys having or wanting to have big toys too, right? So the latest, the newest one we would want Although in our in, in my experience, I've tried the 4K, I've tried the 3D. I love the 3D actually, especially for a more advanced procedures. Uh, single port procedures, especially for lab coli, a 3D vision would uh, greatly help you. But mind you, even having said that, even for novice uh, doctors, 3Ds, 3D surgery. It's not, you know, uh, it's not applicable to everyone. Uh, there are some subsets of patients who cannot take a 3D vision because of uh, issues on vertigo and everything. So these are the things that, you know, trying to keep in mind and trying to keep into your armamentarium and then try to make use of it for the advantage of your patient. Yeah, and that's funny you should do Interesting that you mentioned a uh, single port and then you were using uh, added uh, mini instrument. Actually, that's how I got my interest into mini because I was doing single port and then I was struggling with, with triangulation, you know. So then I said, hey, let me put one small, you know, the teleflex or previously striker alligator yeah, yeah, yeah. poke through and grasp the Hartman and then the surgery became very fast. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I, Vimal, uh, I think that was like 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. There was a huge debate in ELSA on whether doing a mini port or a reduced port versus a single port. So there's always a big debate. And I remember Carvalho, I would I would fight it off. I think yeah. it was our group, right? Carvalho doing the mini port. He was the proponent of mini port before 
it's more of you know it's not it's no longer a fight between you know who's better or who's not but what can we give you know to our yeah. patients to make your, you know to make your surgery better or to make it better for the patient yeah. i think it's not a surgeon's bravado it's more of a question of patient safety nowadays yeah you're right yeah uh, we agree uh, professor it's more of uh, indeed the uh, patient safety and uh, having uh, different uh, armamentarium behind you to do uh, different types of uh, surgeries. So, uh, Dr. Allen, uh, is there a, a transition point wherein if you want to uh, go from multi-port to uh, single port, uh, is there a very steep learning curve here? Or have you also have uh, some advice on how you modify your exposure or dissection uh, using just a single port versus a multi port I, I think being Sir John's and being, you know, playful and inquisitive, our tendency is actually to push the envelope. So we're used to doing four-part lap poly. Sir John's now would want to experiment doing a three-part lap poly, you know? Like having the idea of reducing one port would greatly, you know, reduce the pain of, of patients or would greatly improve the cosmesis of, uh, of patients. So from a three-port view, the movement actually of three-port lap coli would exactly mimic what a single-port lap coli would do if you're using one single curve and one, one hand instrument. But, you know, when we were doing it early on, remember we mount 15, 20 years ago when we started doing it, our experience was painful. Why? Because it's, you know, at first you were doing it on a crisscross instruments, right? Before the advent of the oh, yeah. single curve instruments and everything, the, the instruments that you have right now. Then, of course, trying to overcome the learning curve. But right now, because of a lot of technology, improvements in instrument, improvement in uh, vision, in, you know, and then having surgeons who had the experience of doing it, trying to proctor you or trying to teach you, I think it's easier now to go over the hill to be able to you know, overcome that steep learning curve. It's easier nowadays. Uh, it took us how many years, right? Uh, I, we've been in practice, me and Vimal have been in practice, uh, I think as long as you know, we can remember. <laughs> 2003. We, yeah, so we experienced it, and then we, we were able to get our, our skills and our experience the hard way, you know, learning from our own mistake. I think it's, you know, it, uh, you know, technology through the years becomes better. Obviously, skills becomes better also. So now the younger surgeons have a better way of learning it, learning from other people's mistakes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there are some questions in the chat box as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Arlene Fernandez, you have uh, other questions for Dr. Ray? Uh, good evening. There, there are questions probably uh, addressed to me. Uh, uh, questions on how do I know if I have complete myotomy with OM. Well, we measure it actually, uh, the length of the scope down into the stomach. And we know that we're in the area of the stomach and then do the myotomy according to the principles of two to three centimeters uh, myotomy in the stomach and around three to five in the esophagus. So that's what we follow. Uh, uh, some endoscopists would just do the inner circular but I will do a full myotomy and then do the fundoplication after that. And uh, the question again now comes, is it necessary to do the fundoplication? I don't know, probably not, but some POM patients will not complain of reflux symptoms after the POEM. But uh, since our patients are in the marginalized uh, group, we don't want them to touch base the hospital uh, as many as as many times as they can. Uh, I mean, as as many times, as many points. 
So um, if we can treat this patient uh, uh, with their achalasia problem and then uh, not having them come back for the uh, reflux uh, problem, then uh, I think uh, to us the phone duplication is uh, important. Now, with regards to how to avoid migration, probably this is for the esophageal stent. Now, uh, our other method stents for that matter. For esophageal stents, there are a lot of stents, especially if you use uh, uncovered stent, then uh, migration is a lot lesser. Uh, but uh, we can use clips. We can use even the Ovesco clamp. There's an Ovesco clamp that is mainly for uh, as a fragile uh, stem, and even do some suturing to anchor the uh, as a fragile stem. Uh, that's what we do in Mayo Clinic with my professor before. Uh, we just put one or two sutures using the Apollo overstitch to anchor the as a fragile stem, especially if it's intended for palliation. Uh, there are certain stems that have double sides, meaning a bare one or an uh, uncovered part, and then there's a siliconized part, uh, the inner lumen. Uh, it's uh, the deep type by Tai Wong or the double type by Tai Wong. It uh, supposedly uh, has lesser migration, especially for tumors. And um, another question here is, do you think that the Apollo apparatus will have a role in high perianal fistula? Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't used that in that uh, particular uh, uh, disease entity. Another question coming up in the chat box. Yes, uh, sir. Is the, door, is the door better than the Dupay or the Heller's myotomy? It depends. Uh, but for Achalasia, especially uh, uh, the, the door is just there to accentuate the angle of ease, then... Uh, probably a door from duplication will suffice. But for cramp reflux problems or diseases, then uh, uh, a decent a, um, from duplication are to pay. But uh, you know, the door from duplication is an anterior wrap. So any, any uh, mucosal break there that you might have missed, a dolphin duplication, it might be very helpful to cover that mucosal break uh, in a Heller's myotomy. Okay. So I'd not, I would not go for a, a toupee or a phone duplication because of uh, extensive uh, dissection of the paraesophageal or phrenic esophageal link. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sarmento. Dr. Sarmento, if you, after doing PARM, are you going to, uh, do you prefer uh, doing... Uh, Phone duplication uh, through the endoscope or do it uh, uh, intra abdominally to a laparoscope? Okay, now uh, that's a good question, uh, Remy. Um, after a poem, uh, then you know you can elect not to do a phone duplication. But now, Professor Inoue, the proponent of this procedure, already has uh, come up with what we call the poem plus F, a phone duplication done via the endoscope. It is by actually clipping up the fundus. Once you go through the myotomy, a full thickness myotomy, now entering the abdominal cavity, the endoscope, through a, uh, the biopsy force or the biopsy force uh, port, be able to uh, place a portion of the fundus into the part wherein the mucosa or the muscle entry is. Uh, it's done by using clips and uh, what we call the uh, end loops, no? And then uh, another way to do it is just do the poem, let the patient go home, and if ever the patient would have some reflux symptoms, uh, there are other uh, endoscopic procedures to address uh, a reflux like the ARMS wherein you uh, do some mucosectomies around the area of the GE junction and induce scarring and uh, tightens up the GE junction. So, uh, but uh, for me, since I'm a surgeon, I do the poem, the myotomy side, and then just do a very fast 30-minute uh, uh, dorsal duplication, a modified dorsal duplication. 
I mean modified because I did not dissect the uh, phrenical, esophagophrenical ligaments and actually just suture uh, one or two into the uh, root right root. Okay. One or Thank two you. sutures of the fundus into the right root. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sarmento. Jimmy, do you have other questions? Uh, yes, and uh, I have some word about uh, Dr. Sumit. Could you hear me? Yeah, it's clear. Uh, Jimmy? Go ahead. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. sorry. My my, bat my battery running out, you know. Wireless is not so good. <laughs> And uh, then I have some words because I very congratulations to the Philippine society because in Taiwan, the endoscopy just at the beginning about how to put endoscopy in our daily laparoscopy surgery. So we also very, very like to sh listen to your lectures. And, uh, and in my opinion, so in the era of nice, the surgeon, the turn of surgeon didn't belong to the man who hold the knife because at least we only hold the first 11 night at once, right? So did you still, maybe we, we have a endoscopic surgeon or endo, not only just endoscopist who do the screen, who only do the screen test. So I just wonder how you put in through the idea of endo, surgical endoscopy to your daily life. Did you still do the screen one? screen endoscopy for UGI for chronoscopy, or you just uh, focus on the intervention of the difficult cases? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, you know, the surgeon doing endoscopy actually threads on uh, a very thin line between having friends and uh, having so many enemies, especially when surfing happens in uh, in our country, but uh, of course, uh, just to uh, be uh, what I call in the middle ground or in the situation wherein everybody is happy, I would just concentrate myself on doing uh, interventional or uh, therapeutic endoscopy. The screening happens uh, only in some patients wherein I do uh, like uh, uh, a surgery, I do an endoscopy before doing surgery, but I do not uh, incorporate into my practice diagnostics uh, anymore or even uh, surveillance uh, colonoscopy procedures. But sometimes I would, uh, uh, some patients will come to me, so I do them. Uh, but uh, basically, I just uh, 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 Settle into the area of therapeutic endoscopy, uh, and of course, I have uh, some uh, GI physician colleagues who would refer their interventional cases or their uh, therapeutic endoscopy cases to me, and then they're the ones doing the diagnostic part of the endoscopy. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I think Don't it's those. Yes, Jimmy. Oh, sorry. I think it's the spirit of the ELSA because the ELSA is the endoscopy and the laparoscopy society. At the very beginning, we try to treat people in a nice way. So we have endoscopy because if we don't share or learn the endoscopy, it's just like an odor of, of bubble milk tea without bubble. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, my, my, my concern. Thank you. Agree, agree with you. Uh, Actually, uh, many parts of Asia, the surgeons do their own endoscopies, upper and lower, including diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Even in Malaysia, it's the same. So our training has always been to do both endoscopy as well as laparoscopy. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Uh, it has been really a fruitful night uh, today. I think uh, before we end this uh, session, I would just uh, ask the our professors to for some few words uh, before we close. Professors, well, I would like to thank uh, the Philippine Society Tugs Ish for this uh, honor of uh, talking. Uh, thank you, Vami. Uh, 
nice to meet my good old friend uh, Alan. <laughs> Brings back all the all the struggles from the early days. Uh, uh, we'll go back to Shanghai one night. Thank you, everyone. I I agree. Let's go back to Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, we would like to thank, of course, the organizers of uh, this webinar, uh, Tugs, uh, from Kelvin Boone, uh, and of course, Bernie and Jimmy. Jimmy, uh, hope to see you soon in uh, yes. Ignad. <laughs> yes, been, we, we It's been 20 months, 20 months now. Yeah, well, we so are anyway, counting the dates. <laughs> yeah, very true. So we would like to, of course, say hi to everyone, and hopefully we'll see each other soon, face to face, and be able to interact with each other uh, personally. Thank you, Doctor Ray. Good morning. Take care. Thank you, bro. So, uh, yeah, Doctor Ray. Me, thank you. Yeah. So, well, I think thank you to Doug for having me here. Uh, it's an honor, actually. So. Uh, to close, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, please, uh, an evaluation form will be uh, sent to you. Uh, and uh, kindly fill up these uh, evaluation forms because these are uh, very important to us. And uh, an e-certificate will be given also via an email. And uh, I invite you to join us uh, this coming January uh, 24th, 20, uh, 29th, 2022 for an advanced diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopy uh, webinar. So uh, again, thank you for our uh, lecturers and our panelists and our guests who have joined us tonight. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh,